So trans thoracic echocardiography has been shown to contribute approximately 98 to 98% of the patients in ICU. In 25% of the cases, the information was decisive. Approximately 38% it added as a supplement. And in 356 of the patients, it was really supportive. So the talk of the day is eco for the intensivist. Myself, Puneet, I'm an additional professor in Ames, New Delhi. I'll be giving you a brief overview of the eco for the intensivist. So this was way back in 2016. I just kept this photograph to highlight upon the three things. This was in a small town of Haldwani where we did our first workshop and we hampered upon the fact of three T's. Three T's were technology, techniques and training. So the technology is ultrasound. Technique is the eco. Now left is the training. So this, I hope this talk just provides enough simulation or stimulation for you guys to learn the eco, which is a part and parcel of intensive care these days. One should never be the prisoner of the past. It was the past when only cardiologists used to do the echo. Our echo is not meant to replace the cardiologist. It just adds on to the diagnosis in the critical care. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of echocardiography in the intensive care unit? So I will point out the advantages. It is non-invasive. It is real-time monitoring. It requires less time. If you are not able to come to a conclusion, an offline analysis is also possible. Just a word of caution, images in transthoracic echo are inverted and opposed as to the images in transesophageal echo which are upright. Also, the orientation of anterior and posterior is opposite. So, straight away, hitting the basics, this is the transducer and this is the orientation marker. The optimal transducer for a transthoracic echo is a phased array probe. The typical frequency of an adult echo probe is 1 to 5 megahertz. This is the orientation probe marker. So then we, you have your probe, you have to align it, you have to rotate it, you have to tilt it to get a correct, appropriate and a definitive picture. This is a common basic thing while using an ultrasound. Optimal depth, inadequate depth and the excess depth. Optimal depth is required for obtaining a good picture. Patient position. Patient is made supine, turned to the left side for parasternal and apical views. While using it, you might, when the patient is lying supine, patient may be asked to abduct the left arm. This will open up the intercostal spaces. So there are basically three windows and five views. What are the three windows? The three windows are apical, parasternal and subcostal. And the five views are parasternal long axis, parasternal short axis, apical four chamber, subcostal four chamber and subcostal IVCs. Focusing on the windows, the apical, you should place the probe on left fourth or fifth intercostal space. Parasternal, you should place the probe on left second to fourth intercostal space. Subcostal, you should place your probe just below the ziphysternum. Here is a pictorial de depiction, parasternal, apical and subcostal. These are the windows which will give you an entry into the heart. So coming to the parasternal long axis view. Parasternal long axis, you look at the probe. To achieve the parasternal long axis view, the eco probe is placed in the left second or third intercostal space with the marker facing towards the right side of the shoulder. Right side of the shoulder, the probe, the marker, and the second or the third intercostal space. Then the probe is generally swept down from second towards the third or fourth intercostal space to achieve the long axis view. So what all are visible in the long axis view? Is your right ventricle, left ventricle, out, left ventricular outflow tract, atrial, aortic wall, mitral wall, and left atrium. Now concentrate carefully what where we have placed the probe, what structures we are about to see. So this is the parasternal long axis view. Fine. This is the right ventricle, left ventricle, aorta, 
left atrium, aortic wall, mitral wall. Any confusions? That's it. Right ventricle, left ventricle, aortic wall, mitral wall, left atrium, aorta. Again, clear. The parasternal long axis view, what you can see in parasternal long axis view is the right ventricle. You can see its size and function. You can see the left ventricle assess its size and function. Ascending aorta, size, aortic valve motion, whether it's opening or not, any calcification on the aortic valve, you can see the mitral valve motion, opening and calcification. You can comment upon the pericardium, whether any pericardial fluid is not present or not present. I'll again go back. Again, for your convenience, now we can say right ventricle, left ventricle, aortic valve, fine. That's it. Now, now we'll move on to the another view, which is parasternal short axis view. Just remember, this is our probe. This was a pointer. We were pointing it towards the right side of the shoulder. Now we will be pointing it towards the left side. So to achieve a parasternal shock axis view, the probe is rotated clockwise. It's rotated this way towards the probe is rotated clockwise at the same place where the plaques was achieved towards the left. So that the marker on the probe is directed towards the left side of the shoulder of the patient. Parasternal short axis can be obtained at three levels, basically basal, mitral or mid-ventricle level. You can call this aortic, mitral and papillary muscle level. To achieve the other two views, the probe is tilted downwards towards the apex of the left ventricle. Fine. When we were doing a long axis, the pointer was towards the right side of the shoulder. When we are doing a short axis, the, the or probe is rotated clockwise and the marker of the probe is towards the left side of the shoulder. So parasternal short axis view at the aortic level. What will we see at the aortic level? So at the aortic level, we will be seeing right atrium, right ventricle outflow tract, left atrium, and the tricuspid wall. So let's have a look. Fill it up, right ventricle outflow tract, pulmonary artery, right atrium, left atrium. Again, we go back, right atrium, left atrium, aortic wall, outflow tract, right atrium, left atrium, outflow tract, pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery, fine. So this is how we see it, where we place the probe and how we cut the heart in which axis. So what all can we see at the aortic level? Aortic valve, we can see whether it is calcified or not, whether the cusps are opening well or not. We can see the tricuspid valve. We can see its motion. We can see, it will watch out for any tricuspid regurgitation. We can see the pulmonic valve. We can see for its motion and regurgitation. We can also have a look at the right atrium and the left atrium, but they are better assessed in apical four-chamber views. Parasternal short axis or at the mitral wall level. At the mitral wall level, you will see the mitral wall, left ventricle, right ventricle, and the interventricular septum, like this. Fine. Right ventricle, left ventricular, and interventricular septum in the mitral wall. This is how we cut or dissect, or the rays cut or dissect. Left atrium, is better assessed from the apical four chamber view. Tricuspid wall motion and regurgitation, pericardium can be commented upon for pericardial fluid. This is your subcostal IVC. The view, IVC draining into the right atrium. This is how the ultrasound beam dissected. The, see the probe orientation, the marker orientation has been changed. So why do we want to look for subcostal IVC? Basically, we want to measure the volume status of the patient. This is the clinical pearl over here. And where do you look for volume status? Where do you want to measure the IVC? It is just adjacent or below the hepatic vein. You can see the hepatic vein. You can see the IVC. You can see the liver and you can see the atrium. 
So the normal IVC diameter varies from 1.5 to 2.5 centimeter. If the IVC diameter is less than 1 centimeter, it means the patient is severely volume depleted. If the IVC is less than 1.5 centimeter, it is volume depletion. If the IVC is greater than 2.5, that means patient is in overload. This, this slide depicts the variation of the IVC with respiration. So if this is a spontaneously breathing patient, this is the IVC, expiration and inspiration. You can see the difference. In inspiration, IVC diameter is less. So with what happens with positive pressure ventilation when a patient is normal volumic or hypervolumic, there is no variation. If the patient is hypervolumic, there will be variations. So based upon the IVC collapsibility in a spontaneously breathing patient, if it collapses more than 50% with inspiration, then the patient is volume depleted. So what is the Kval index? Kval index, Kval index is maximum expiratory diameter minus minimal inspiratory diameter upon, upon your maximum expiratory diameter. If the collapse is less than 50%, volume overload. If the collapse is greater than 50%, it is volume responsive. Kval index, Ex maximum expiratory minus minimal inspiratory upon maximum expiratory diameter collapse greater than 50% volume responsive if the collapse is less than 50% there is a volume overload. So in adults following correlation is present between the central venous pressure, IVC diameter and respiration. A size of less than 2.1 centimeter and if it collapses more than 50% during a sniff is equal to right atrial pressure of 0 to 5 millimeter of Hg. If the size of IVC is greater than 2.1 centimeter and the collapse is greater than 50% during a sniff, the right atrial pressure is somewhere between 5 to 10 millimeter of Hg. If the size is greater than 2.1 and collapse is less than 50% during a sniff, the right atrial pressure is 10 to 20 millimeter of Hg. Volume status, distensibility and variability index. In a fully supported mechanically ventilated patient, which does not have any respiratory effort, a tidal volume of greater than 8 ml per kg, DI, IVC, D max minus D minimum and diameter minimum, a distensibility index of less than 18%, patient will not be volume responsive. If IVC is greater than 12%, the patient will be fluid responsive. So this was till now the basic echo and the basic assessment of your fluid status. We have till now discussed which view, uh, which probe to use, what are the three, basically three windows and the five views, what all we can see in those views. And why do we look for an IVC and how do we look for a IVC with fluid responsiveness? And now we will move on a step, little step ahead with a little bit of advanced echocardiography. So in this overview, we will look at the echo modes, left ventricular function, mainly systolic function and diastolic function and right ventricular function. So left ventricular function, right ventricular function, systolic function, diastolic functions, right? What do you see here over here is a, are the eco modes, it's a 2D mode. 2D mode means two dimensional cross sectional view. If something is highly reflective, white, it is bone. If it has low reflectivity, it's gray is muscle. And there is no reflection, it is black, it is fluid or water. Then there is an M mode. M mode is used for detecting and recording rapid movements, such as ECG changes or respiratory pressure waveforms traced alongside. It can tell you about the chamber dimensions, fractional shortenings and ejection fractions detecting and recording rapid movements, use M mode. Then there are various Doppler modes. 
color flow Doppler, pulse flow Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, tissue Doppler, and duplex scan. Mainly, we will be discussing pulse wave Doppler and tissue Doppler index. These are certain examples, color flow Doppler imaging across the wall, transmitral gradients, pulse wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, a TDI tissue Doppler. So now coming to the ventricular assessment per se, left ventricular systolic function. So how can we measure left ventricular systolic function? You can see, do it by eyeballing. You can standardly measure the dimensions. There you can use the M mode for E point septal separations. You can look at longitudinal shortening. You can have assessment of fractional shortening. You can look at the fractional area change. You can calculate the ejection fraction. We can use a tissue Doppler and we can measure even the strain by using longitudinal speckle tracking. And we will deal with each of them one by one. What do you want to eyeball? Eyeballing, what are we actually looking for when we eyeball? Basically, we are looking for the inward movement of the endocardium. We are looking for the thickening of the myocardium. We are looking for the motion of the mitral annulus. If there is reduced motion of the interior wall leaflet in plaques, view or not, the interior mitral wall leaflet should ideally come within 8 millimeter of the septal valve in plaques view in systole. In normal motion, less than 8 millimeter, moderately reduced motion, 8 to 18 millimeter, and in severely reduced motion, greater than 18 millimeter. So ideally, the anterior mitral wall leaflet should come within 8 millimeter of the septal wall. We can also look at the size of the left ventricular, any aneurysms, whether present or not. Left ventricular systolic function, is this is the standard two-dimensional measurements of the left ventricular cavity, septal, and the posterior wall thickness normal measurements are mentioned. This one is important. Left ventricular systolic function can be measured by E-point septal separations. Along the, this is the plaques view. These are the two leaflets. And we do it in the M mode. We can see the E-point septal separation. If it is less than seven millimeter, it is normal. And if it is greater than 10 millimeter, it is suggestive of a failure. It has to be measured when the mitral valve is open. Similar depiction over here, E point septal separation. When the mitral valve is open. MAPC. So MAPC basically will tell us about left ventricular systolic function. It's the longitudinal shortening, longitudinal shortening. In an apical four chamber view, four chamber view, the highest and the lowest point of the M mode sinusoid wave are measured, having placed the cursor along the mitral ring. Along the mitral ring, a cursor is placed and the highest and the lowest point, a sinusoid wave is formed. MAPC of greater than 13 millimeter is considered normal. Coming on to the left ventricular systolic function or the fractional shortening, it is calculated using M mode across the left ventricle in a plaques view at a mid ventricular level and is usually expressed as a percentage. Plaques view, mid ventricular level, expressed as a percentage. So, using an M mode, we measure it during end diastole, end systole, and the change is noticed. 
So fractional shortening is like end diastole minus left ventricular and systole into 100. Basically, ejection fraction is equal to 2 into fractional shortening. So end diastole and systole upon end diastole into 100. Normal is 25 to 40%. Mild dysfunction is 20 to 25%. And 20, 15 to 20% is moderate dysfunction. Less than 15% is severe dysfunction. This is fractional shortening. Ejection fraction will be twice into the fractional shortening. You can measure the fractional area change. Fractional area change during diastole, then during systole. So it will be diastole minus systole upon distole into 100. Normal and diastolic area index for body surface area is equal to greater than 5.5 centimeter square per meter square. Calculating the ejection fraction. Ejection fraction will be end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume upon end diastolic volume into 100. Normal is 50 to 55 percent. Moderate dysfunction 30 to 40 percent less than 30 percent is severe dysfunction. This is by modified Simpson's biplane method. You can see during diastole and systole. You can also see the left ventricle systolic function by the tissue Doppler. The normal systole velocity, the systolic velocity S wave is somewhere between 8 to 10 centimeter per second at the lateral ring site. Below 8 centimeters, there is a systolic depression. Below 3 centimeters, it is a severe systolic depression. Till now, we have seen the systolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. Again, this one, this slide is very important. Left ventricle systolic function calculated by the ejection fraction. This is modified Simpson's biplane method. You should also know how to calculate the fractional shortening. Fractional shortening using M mode across the left ventricular in flax mode at the mid ventricular level. MAPC and E point septal separation can tell you about the left ventricular systolic function. Eyeballing the most commonly used. In an experienced hand, eyeballing is quite reasonable to tell you about the left ventricular function. Coming to the diastolic dysfunction. What is a diastolic dysfunction? Diastolic dysfunction is the inability of the ventricle to fill to its normal end diastolic volume without an inappropriate increase in in diastolic pressure. So basically the ventricle is not able to fill to its normal end diastolic volume without increasing the pressure. It can happen in elderly age, it can happen in a diabetic patient, it can happen in patients with metabolic syndromes, in hypertensive patients, in patients with uh, right patients with ventricular hypertrophy, in patients with aortic stenosis and restrictive heart diseases. This is our phys basic physiology. What are the various phases of diastole? Depending upon the various phases of diastole, we have isovolumetric relaxation when the aortic wall closes. And the duration is when the aortic wall closure prior to the opening of the mitral wall. Early rapid ventricular filling, which gives us the E wave. Mitral wall opens and majority of the left ventricular preload contributes to, contributing to it. Mesodiastolic phase or the diastasis phase is a low flow phase. And then there is a arterial contraction which gives rise to an A wave. It contributes to 20% of the preload. Important is early rapid ventricular filling giving E wave and contraction giving A wave. So when we are looking at left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, we use pulse wave Doppler assessment across the transmitral wall. We will be assessing transmitral flow. Pulse wave Doppler is placed across the mitral valves. E and E waves are formed. 
E waves represent the early diastolic filling and A waves represent the atrial contribution to the left ventricular preload as we have discussed in the prior slide. Then there is a period of diastasis in E and A waves that we have discussed with the with this envelope thus obtained. There is an isovolumetric relaxation time, E wave, A wave velocities and an E by A ratio can be measured. Going back, isovolumetric relaxation, early rapid filling, E wave, diastasis waves and a contraction wave producing A wave. So we can have IVRT, basically isovolumetric relaxation time. We can have E wave velocity, A wave velocity and an E by A ratio. So the normal E wave velocity is 0.8 plus minus 2 and a normal A wave velocity is 0.5 plus minus 2. This is left ventricular diastolic function, pulse wave assessment of transmitral flow. Transmitral flow, pulse wave is placed and this type of a uh, wave is produced where we can see the E wave and the A wave and measure their velocity. So the R parameters of interest over are E peak velocity, E wave deceleration time, A peak velocity and E by A ratio. So either diastolic dysfunction can be graded as normal, impaired, pseudo-normal or restrictive. So impaired LV relaxation where there is reduced diastolic filling. Normal LV filling but a pseudo-abnormal relaxation with increased left ventricular and diastolic pressure. Then there is restrictive LV filling, advanced reduction in the compliance. This is a pictorial representation depicting various stages of diastolic dysfunction. Normal diastolic dysfunction, my normal diastolic function is E by A less than 1.5. Stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4. Stage 1 is impaired relaxation. E by A less than equal to 0.75. Moderate less than 1.5. Stage 3 severe greater than 1.5. Severe and fixed, severe and fixed, greater than 1.5. Now, when we use a tissue Doppler imaging to measure the annular velocity, we can look at the left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. Carefully look at the orientation, annular velocity. Annular velocity and then a tissue Doppler is placed, then we obtain the septal and A ratio. E, ratio. e should be greater than 8 to 10 centimeters per second. On the lateral wall, have a look again. Me, this one is medial, this one is lateral. So, LV diastolic function by tissue Doppler imaging, measuring the annular velocity. Usually the E by E ratio reflects the diastolic dysfunction or the pressure. Normally it is less than eight and greater, if it is, if it is greater than 15, it is considered to be elevated. Measuring the annular velocity. TDI of the lateral E less than 10 cm and septal less than 7 cm per second is suggestive of diastolic dysfunction. E by E ratio of less than 8 is normal and a ratio of more than 15 is associated with left ventricular diastolic dysfunction in non-ventilated patients. A ratio of more than 12 is sufficient to identify diastolic dysfunction in patients on mechanical ventilation. We'll go back once. To let you know the lateral, septal, annular velocities and the photograph depicting. This is a pulse wave assessment for trans along the 
transmitral wall, pulse wave. Fine. Here you get a capital E and a capital A. Velocities, peak velocities and A peak velocities and we look for E by A ratio. Coming next, when we put a tissue Doppler imaging for measuring the annular velocity, this is septal and this is lateral. Fine. That's how we see the E by E ratio of less than 8 is normal or more than 15 is associated with LV diastolic dysfunction. This is the flow chart you can go through where it depicts the normal, impaired, pseudo-normal and the restrictive pattern. So going through the left ventricle, now we need our body, mind and the spirit again back. So we can proceed further. I know it's a little difficult to explain it without showing hands-on, but it will definitely help you in practicing on the ultrasound if it's available with you. So proceeding with the right ventricular function. Right ventricular systolic function. Normally right ventricular area or left ventricular area is less than 0.6. And right ventricular length is less than 0.6 of the left ventricular length. The dilatation of the right ventricle can be graded as mild, moderate and severe. Mild will be right ventricular area upon left ventricular area equal to 0.6, equal to 1 and greater than 1. So what are the causes of right ventricular dilatation and dysfunction? Right ventricle may be dilated and dysfunctioning due to pulmonary artery hypertension, coronary artery disease, tricuspid or pulmonary regurgitation, Atrial or ventricular septal defect, dilated cardiomyopathy, which may be idiopathic, chemotherapy induced, or pregnancy induced. So, here we can see the right ventricular systolic function in 2D measurements, basically in measuring the wall thickness. It has to be less than, it has to be less than 0.5 centimeters. You can even look at the right ventricular systolic functional area change. This is your right ventricle in end diastole. This is your right ventricle in end systole in an apical four chamber view. End diastolic area minus end systolic area upon end diastolic area into 100. Normal fractional area change is greater than 30%. It correlates well with the right ventricular ejection fraction. This is very important. Like MAPSI, here it is TAPSI. TAPSI is basically tricuspid annular excursion. Tricuspid annular excursion in the M mode, the cursor of the eco probe is placed at the lateral annulus of the tricuspid wall. And the excursion of the annulus is measured in the systole. It, TAPSI has been found to be correlating well with the ejection fraction of the right ventricle. So, Tricuspid annular excursion, eco probe played at the lateral annulus. During systole, the excursion is measured, maximum minus minimum. If TAPSI is greater than 20 millimeter, it is low risk. And if it is less than 60 millimeter, it is high risk. Basically, the rejection fraction is twice into TAPSI. Normal right ventricular rejection fraction is approximately 40%. Here you can see where we have placed on the lateral tricuspid annulus and we measure it during excursion and we see that a TAPSI of 20 corresponds to a right ventricular rejection fraction of 40%, almost twice, 15, 30, 10, 20, 5, 10. So this is your TAPSI. Uh, we might not be, we are not touching upon the cardiac output and further issues. And this is my last slide always. Like if you fail, you learn again and then you succeed. And we keep on repeating this cycle. The take home is you should be able to know which or what all are the indications of an, doing an eco in the intensive care patient. What all, which probe to use, what three windows to use, what five views to use, and then how to get those views, what all to look on these views. How to eyeball, 
how to look for left ventricle normal systolic function, diastolic dysfunctions, and right ventricular function. We are here not to replace the cardiologist, but to assess at a particular point of time and point of, to provide a particular point of care to the patient which we receive in our ICU. With this, I would like to thank Dr. Tapesh for giving me this opportunity. And I think uh, it was, I had kept myself a little low on uh, these things, number of slides. So I have finished it, uh, I think, within 45 minutes. And I hope it's OK. Thank you all. And thank you, everyone, for the patient hearing. Yeah. So please stop the share screen. And if there are any questions, we will take the questions. So please put up your questions if you have any. <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir. A very uh, nice, brief and succinct basics of echocardiography. Uh, your video is off, sir. Uh, so we just wait for a couple of minutes if there are any questions. So you're muted also. You got muted also. Uh, yeah. Tabish, this uh, is actually the later part of the... Uh, See, till it is till the basic echocardiography, it is very comfortable to judge upon by listening. But the later part, unless and until you deal, you have an ultrasound machine at hand, you have the knobs, you tell them how to place a tissue Doppler, how to place a pulsed wave Doppler, these things have to be practiced a lot. Right, sir. Definitely, workshop kind of a situation is needed for this. This thing, yeah. Okay, sir. so I think uh, there are no questions. Uh, so thank you very much. And just uh, one thing I sir, wanted to ask for a personal listening. Uh, so you have written so many books. I am also writing the book on critical, critical care. So how did you actually write the manuscript? Did you type it and uh, yourself or use some uh, app or did you write it and uh, what it typed? How did it happen? It is like uh, I, in critical care, I have two books. Anji. One is uh, infectious disease in critical care and one is this ultrasound in critical care. So the most important thing is to dis uh, have your content ready. Content means what all chapters you want in it. Achha, wo chapters ready karke you, it is impossible to write the whole book on your own. So you need to have co-authors. You can be the chief editor. You keep hmm. the best chapters or the better chapters in which you feel you have an expertise. Anji. You keep those chapters with you Anji. and other chapters you distribute. And before that, you draw a particular guideline. Means Anji. in that chapter, you will likely to cover those 5 or 10 headings. Anji. That wo, us heading ke andar wo cover hona chahiye. Wo hai. What actually, more I want to know is that the writing part of how to do it? How to do it? How to do it? Sir, it will be written in document. Mein hi likhna type it in document. Type karna padega. And if you can't type, then you have to write it and get it typed. Typing is not so difficult. It's so difficult. Is there any app that helps me? Is there any speech to text? Sir, today, I haven't used it. One oh. that chat GPT has come. You can say anything, it will write anything. I tried it. There are a lot of errors. There are a lot of errors. How did you do it, sir? Did you type it in your hand or did you type it in your hand? नहीं नहीं सर वो मैं basically see अगर आप मेरी कोई भी book देखेंगे ना उसके अंदर I have not kept more than three to four chapters with me मतलब अगर उसमें बीस chapter हैं तो चार से पांच chapter ही रखते हैं और एक किताब को लिखने में साल डेढ़ साल लग जाता है हाँ तो उस chapter को वो खुद ही type करना पड़ता है word document पे वरना वो फिर मजा नहीं आता ठीक है सर thank you sir thank you sir thank you very much see you again sometimes sir thank you so much sure 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 thank you thanks for the opportunity thank you